Okay, so let me let me start the podcast with a, a bit of a story. In 2018, I was in Chamonix in France, and for everybody who knows, of course, that's uh, the place where the start of the Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc, or what is known as the UTMB, um, begins. And I was actually there. Uh, I was running in one of the smaller races, so I'd finished my race, and I was there for the start of the 2018 UTMB. It was raining. And uh, I got there about four hours before the start so that I could get right against the barrier, right in the starting chute where the, the UTMB starts. So they're about to go, all the best ultra runners from around the world are about to go 170 kilometers around Mont Blanc in the mountains, 10,000 meters of climbing. And there's a massive crowd for the start, most prestigious uh, ultra run in Europe. And the, 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 the thing starts and it builds. There's a big noise. The crowd's noisy. The gun goes off. The leaders go running like it was a 5K race. And the whole town sort of raises and they run through the town. And everybody's cheering uh, and applauding. And uh, 2,500 runners leave on an epic journey some of them extremely fast. And as, as they leave, um, it's a tradition. There's this song by, uh, music by Vangelis called The Conquest of Paradise. It's incredibly emotional. It sort of rises in a crescendo and then the slower runners go by. And it was a superb emotional um, uh, event. And, and as I watched the, the slower runners, I, I noticed you know, one runner, absolutely crying his eyes out. Tears were just streaming down his face. The emotion of the whole event had got to them and he, he was crying and waving to the crowd, tears of joy. And then I noticed there was another one and they were crying too. And I thought, wow, this is not a one-off. And I was looking at, and I saw maybe, I don't know, four or five people who were overcome with emotion at the start of the race. They haven't even sort of taken 30 meters, 40 meters on their, on their 40 hour journey. And suddenly I realized these people have made an immense sacrifice to qualify, to get into this race, to just be there is one of their life's ambitions. And they've sacrificed so much to do all the qualifying races and just get to the start line. Getting to the finish line is another, is another event for them. Just to be there at the start was an incredible thing that I didn't realize how big it was. And today we're going to hear what goes into that journey. The Rise of the Ultra Runners with Adaran and Finn. Hi, and welcome to Running Book Reviews Podcast, where we review the running books to help you decide whether you'd like to read the book for yourself. We also hope that listening to us chat about running will give you the motivation or the inspiration that you need to try and develop or do something new or just get out the door and do your stuff. My name is Alan Miller, and with my co host Liz McCrusa, we're going to talk with the author Adaran and Finn about his latest book. Rise of the Ultra Runners, a journey to the edge of human endurance. And boy, are we in for a treat. So this book is uh, divided into 18 chapters and describes Adaran, Adaranan's uh, introduction to ultra events as a journalist who also happens to be a keen runner. Uh, the book uh, reads like a story, uh, starting with how Adaranan a little reluctantly, it seems like at first, decides to register for his first ultra event after his employer asks him to write about it. The book goes on to chart at Aranan's growing interest in ultra running and his ambition to qualify for the UTMB and also run it in 2018. For those who are unfamiliar with the UTMB, as I was maybe a few years ago, it's a little like the Boston Marathon of ultra trail running. So you need to qualify, and qualifying doesn't guarantee you entry. So Darren and uh, qualifies by running various ultra runs in Europe and the U.S. to have the uh, the required qualifying points. 
And throughout his journey, he interviews successful ultra runners to see what motivates them to keep running and training for these extreme distances. So a little bit about the authors. So Adair and Anne Finn is, a, is an assistant a production editor for The Guardian newspaper in the UK, a freelance writer and author of three award-winning books. So this was the third. So his first book was Running with the Kenyans, Discovering the Secrets of the Fastest People on Earth. He also wrote The Way of the Runner, which talks about Jap the Japanese obsessive running culture. And uh, the book we're talking about today is his most recent release, so Rise of the Ultra Runners, A Journey to the Edge of Human Endurance. Adaranand also organizes running and writing retreats, which you can find at his website, wayoftherunner.com. He also has a podcast of the same name. Adaranand is an accomplished runner and writes from a runner's perspective. The latest book, Rise of the Ultra Runners, also documents his own rise as an ultra runner in 2018. So I would like to welcome Adair Anand and thanks for joining us because right now in the UK, it is it's past 5 your 30. So it's past my bedtime, which is normally like 8 30. <laughs> so welcome Adair Anand and thank you very much for joining us. Oh, it's nice, nice to be here. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's one minute to 10 precisely. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. Yes. I would have been in uh, probably in the deep phase of my sleep right now. <laughs> so the logical first thing to ask you is given that you decided to try for the ultra trail de Mont Blanc it was probably logical for you to write a book about this, but how did it all come about? I know you're a journalist and you're also a runner, but you weren't a uh, an ultra runner at the time. No, no. So it was, it was kind of a few strands coming together. Uh, so I'd, I'd, I, yeah, I, I always thought of ultra running. I, I mean, initially I didn't know anything about ultra running. I'd heard vague mentions of people running around tracks for 24 hours. And I, I had strange images in my head about that, but I didn't know that much about it. But, it, but, but then over the years, it, it's been a growing sport recently, as most people will know. Most people probably in the same way as I was, gradually became aware of it. And now it seems to be everywhere now. It's almost talked about as much as as any other element of running uh so it was so it was something that was growing in my awareness uh and then at one point you're right you mentioned it the uh it was the financial times newspaper in the uk offered me they said they said they'd been given my name and um, when i do a travel piece on the amman desert marathon which is a hundred mile race across the desert and i i got this email and i i without any hesitation in about two seconds i emailed him back i said no sorry i that's not the kind of thing I do. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't worry about it, and I didn't think any more about it. And then I spoke to my wife that la that night, and I said, "Yeah, the FT asked me to, uh, you know, go and run the Amman Desert Marathon, but you know, of course, I said no." And she she obviously she's not a runner, so she probably didn't get this perspective that I was taking it from. And she just said, "Well, I thought you liked running. You're being asked to go as a job to go and run. Don't people spend a lot of money doing this?" And I started thinking about it and I thought, yeah, why do pe people do spend a lot of money on these races? And, and I've been given this opportunity. Maybe I should try it out. Uh, and also then I started thinking of it differently. When I started thinking that people like, are aspiring to do this and why are they aspiring to do it? I realized, while maybe it wasn't from my runner perspective, what I wanted to do from the from a life experience perspective uh, and from an adventure perspective, it was quite an exciting proposition when I thought about it. So, uh, so I got back to the FT and, and then he actually said, oh, you don't need to do it all. Just do a couple of days and then, you know, that will do. But I, I was like, no, I, then I'd got this idea of crossing the desert. The adventure was really what was grabbing me. And so I did it. And the book begins with the Oman Desert Marathon. I didn't do very well. I struggled. I hadn't done any practicing running on sand. The sand was very soft, as sand generally is, although I'd been told it wasn't all soft sand, but it was. And, and so I kind of hated it, but after I'd finished, you know, and I did that thing that a lot of people will probably do at the end of their first ultra marathon, you say, never again, never, ever am I doing anything like that again. And then as the days go by, you start having these thoughts about the intensity. I think there's something about the intensity of the experience of being out there and being alone in the desert and struggling and then getting through it. I mean, a couple of times I thought I was going to have to stop and I didn't. And that sense of being challenged and also i felt like i didn't I, when i thought about it i felt like i could have pushed more i could have got through that a bit better i was a bit weak there I, you know i i didn't quite fulfill 
my abilities and, and, and that slightly gnawed at me. Anyways, I didn't really think of it that much more, but then this sport of ultra running just became more and more prevalent. And I, as a journalist who'd written two books on running, I was kind of looking for a subject and I just actually, this line, the rise of the ultra runners, which became the title, just popped into my head one night. And I just suddenly got this vision of a journalistic journey into this world. I'd been to Kenya, I'd been to Japan, but here was a subculture of running that I knew nothing about. And yet I was quite fascinated by suddenly, uh, I tasted it, but I hadn't quite fully understood it, but I knew there was something there. And I just got this vision of, you know, trying to work out why, so each, each book had a different kind of quest in a way. The first book with the Kenyans was why are they so fast? The second book in Japan is just what's going on in Japan. Most people don't know that there's a running scene in Japan. And so with the ultrans, why are people doing this? Why are people, what is the appeal of it? Because to me and to a lot of people who don't do it, it seems mad. It seems, why would you do that to yourself? Why would you run, you know, hundreds of miles through the night or just around a running track or across the desert? You know, maybe go on a camel safari across the desert. Yeah, or, you know, take, take, take a hike through the mountains where you camp at night. But to run through it, it didn't, you know, that didn't appeal to me in a weird way. <laughs> at all but I was fascinated by it then when I started looking around for a kind of structure to the book the UTMB I, I soon realized actually about this same time I started following ultra running a bit closer and I was following the UTMB online so I watched the start online I was actually in the office Friday, Friday it starts 6 30 in the evening so I guess in UK time that was maybe 5 30 I was in the office and I, I watched them all leave that dramatic start you were describing uh, and I watched I watched them leave, and and then I kind of followed it for a bit. But obviously, it's a slow moving event, so I kind of forgot about it. I I got home, I I got the train, I went home, I went you know had had food, went to bed, got up the next morning, and I suddenly thought they're still running. They're still running, yeah, I know. So I logged on, and there they were, running, 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 running. I was that's strange. And then and then I got on with my day. I went for a run or something. I went maybe to the shops to send my kids. And that evening, I suddenly thought most of those people are still running <laughs> yeah and this is this was slightly bizarre to me but something was quite i was getting a little bit jealous by this idea that they were out in the mountains for all that time running and, and then i'd log on and there they were you could see people and you know their faces were looking like wired and intense and then even sunday morning again i said like, there's some of those people are still going and that that was friday night and this is sunday now sunday and so I decided the UTMB, well, it didn't necessarily have to be the UTMB, but at that kind of race, I really wanted to experience. And then for various reasons, that was the race that worked best for me. It was, you know, not too far from the UK. It was, it was just kind of becoming the, the kind of biggest race in the world. I know there were a few rivals to that in, in different ways, but, and, and also nobody had really written about it. Uh, I felt like there'd been a few books on, Spartathlon is another big race, or uh, I've got a blank on on the other ones. Comrades is a big race, but here in uh, North America, we talk about Western states, yeah, which is yeah, the, the longest states, established, most yeah. difficult one to get into. Uh, well, that, that was the problem with Western states. I didn't want to aim for a race and then not get in. Where the UTMB, they kind of I contacted them and they they do. You still have to qualify. You still have to get all the points. But if you're writing about it, and I as a Guardian journalist, I was going to be able to kind of guarantee myself a, a place as long as I got the points. So that that made sense as well from that point of view. So anyway, so then I began, set out on this journey. And uh, and yeah, I, 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 I kind of maintained this. Initially, I'd see the speeds they were running at, you know, they're running 10 minute miles, we're working in miles, so you know, seven minute, eight minute kilometers. I mean, it's pretty slow going. It's not much faster than walking pace, I'm thinking. I can do this. I mean, this. Yeah, actually, uh, actually, uh, over that terrain, it's quite quick. That what you just said. Well, exactly. That's what I didn't realize yeah. at the time. So I'm thinking, this is no problem. I'm going to be near the front. I, I, <laughs> I actually and I've spoken to lots of ultra runners who come from that track background and and the road background, and they had the same thought. And even some great, you know, elite runners who go into ultra running. You know, thinking these guys are, are not on my level. I can destroy them, and 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 yeah. You once you get into that race, once you get fifty miles into a mountainous trail race, just to be moving is 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 the challenge, and uh, at any speed. 
yeah, when we do when we do our own trail running, um, Liz always gets a bit um, cheesed off because yeah. she'll say, "We've been out here for two hours and we've only covered uh, <laughs> yeah. we've only covered thirteen kilometers. What the hell are we doing?" Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling yeah. you. I so can we're usually... having a two hour experience. We're not having a 13 kilometer experience. Exactly. You have to change your parameters. You're, you're no longer worrying about distance. I actually, the two things you worry about is time. So you spend, this is a two hour run or a four hour run or a six hour run. That's what matters. The distance matter. And then the elevation, yeah. I realized as I was getting near the mountains, that my Strava chart, I was, I was, it was set on elevation, not on distance because that, that's what I was needing. And, uh, yeah, the distance becomes irrelevant in a way and and once you get you know well anyone as you know if you've done ultra marathons you know speed is uh, <laughs> you know you can be sat still for half an hour so if you're moving for half an hour you're making gains on all those people who are just sitting there staring at the <laughs> the back of the pain cave and wondering what's gonna yeah. happen I still have kind of a hard time with that though. Even after having done a couple of trail races, I, it's still, you know, I, we go to this, um, this mountain. So we, we go to Mont Tremblant, which is about an hour from Montreal to train. And if you go up the mountain straight up, it's about, I think it's a little less than three kilometers and it gives you like 600 meters of elevation. So that one it's climb. Quite steep. Yeah, so we try and do it like two or three times and, and then you run down sort of an easier way that you then you came up. So the run down is longer. It's about 5K. But the thing is the whole run, let's say you go up and down three times, it'll give you like maybe 20K. I don't even think, I don't even remember if it gives you that much. So for me, like when you're out running your Saturday long run and I can go for 30 K and then I can do a full day of like groceries and dishes and laundry and housework. And I go for this 20 K trail run and then I'm totally useless. And I need a nap after <laughs> I just, it's harder, right? it's, harder. it's hard. And what's even harder is that then you, like I look back at my, at my watch and I see like average pace, like 13 minutes per kilometer and I just I have such a hard time with it and Alan and um and my boyfriend my boyfriend loves trail running and it, his name's Andre so Andre laughs at me so much all the time I because I can't get over how slow my kilometers are and yet I'm like toast I'm totally done done for the day and then in your book, so I, I noticed another thing because I've always done sort of shorter trail races. So I've never done these like super like a hundred miles, uh, oh, like overnight kind of things. And you mentioned more than once how at one point you always start hallucinating. So did you know that this was going to happen before you started? And after it happens, how do you go back and do it again when you know that this is well, going to happen? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I'd heard about hallucinations, but I wasn't really looking out for them or expecting them. Uh, and the first time they happened, they were, it was quite scary because I was on my own on the mountain and uh, it was dark, obviously. Yeah, I, I got quite scared because I started realizing I could follow one of the, I could follow the, I was seeing, at one point I was seeing cocktail parties and people <laughs> waiters walking around with trays and I was thinking it was the aid station and I was calling the other runners over and they, they were ignoring me. But then when I realized there was nothing there, it was just a, like the side of the mountain. I was like, I, I'm, you know, I'm going to die up here. This is terrible. Uh, and then, and then, so I, I managed, so a runner came by and I just decided to stick to this runner like clue, whatever happened until I got off this hill. So then this is what happens in the UTMB is I, I'm going into the second night and I'm, and I'm convincing myself, I don't want to do that again. And that's what, that's the main reason I feel like I have to drop out and, Maybe I won't say whether I did or didn't because that's kind of a, a dramatic bit of the book. But I get to this point where the fear of hallucinating up on the mountain again. And I feel like I remember thinking, so I've done that. I've, you know, as a life experience, I did that once. I don't want to go there again. But there are, yeah, there are lots of runners who run the whole time and they just get used to these hallucinations. And I mean, I spoke to one lady, she was 87 and she was doing these overnight ultra runs. And she was like, well, normally I'm with my friends and we take my friend and we take turns to hallucinate. But this time I was on my own. So I was just doing it myself. <laughs> like so matter of fact. 
So I don't know. I, I mean, I guess if you're not on a mountain, it's probably not as scary uh, because there's not that maybe risk of falling off, off the cliff. She was she was getting them on the on the track races. Yeah, I, it's not something I was I was looking out for. I, you know, then there are races that go on for longer. You know, there's one of the UT the races in UTMB week is like I can't remember which one it is. Is it the PTL? There's one that goes on for like 400 or 300 yeah. kilometers. Yeah, the petit the petit trot de yeah. Lyon. Exactly. Yeah, it goes on for like 300 kilometers. Yeah, yeah. and they, those wow. you know they're all you know there's almost nobody in that race. I mean, maybe a few people have got specially wired brains that don't hallucinate, but they're almost all hallucinating. And, and for some people, I think there's an you know an attraction to that, an appeal in that. But I certainly wasn't. I wasn't. That's not why I was doing it. I wasn't looking out for it. It was more of a, a byproduct. It was quite entertaining to write about afterwards, of course, which was which was fine. But yeah, I feel like I survived my hallucinations rather than uh, went looking for them. Sorry, I, I just wa was wondering about those hallucinations. Like, so now looking back, is there a way you could have avoided them? Do you think, or is it just part of the territory? Yeah, I think so. I think it's when you get that tired. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I don't think there's a way of not that I've heard of a way of avoiding hallucination, except taking naps. But if you're in a in a continuous race, you know, you're not really taking naps. I mean, some people do, but that was never my strategy. I did at one point in UTMB try and take a nap, but I just I was too wide or something. There were lots of people around me sleeping at one of the aid stations, just on the tables with their heads on their backs. But I so I tried it because I was so tired. Nothing happened. I was like awake, so I just thought, oh, I'll just carry on. <laughs> it's interesting though your talk about the uh, your your problem with trail running because I just before my race in in California, the Miwok 100 race, I went for a kind of it was like a, a jog a couple of days before with, I, I won't give the names because they were a bit, little bit rude about each other, but uh, uh, a famous, a fairly well-known ultra runner at the time and, uh, and a fairly well-known person who does more track and, and road running. Uh, and then at one point we got to this hill and the road runner, uh, the ultra runner was leading the way because it was his territory and he started walking and he's a very, very good runner. He's like someone who would win races. So the other guy was a bit surprised. He said, we're walking. Why are we walking? And the guy's like, oh, no, we're just, we're walking. This is quite steep. We'll, we'll run when we get to the top. And then the run, the whole run ended up being about 11 miles. Uh, and then the, the kind of road running guy was like, that was quite a long run for a warm up two days before, you know, Darren has got to do this ultra. And he said, well, you know, we were just having fun. And then afterwards, the ultra runner said to me, no, he, you know what the, his problem is? He doesn't enjoy running. He said, <laughs> and, and I thought, I thought about it at the time. I didn't agree with that. I thought, no, he, he actually enjoys running. You're the one who's walking. So, yeah. you know, I, I think he's, he's enjoying it. He wants to run. You want to walk. I think he's the guy who enjoys running. But then when I thought about it afterwards, I could see his point of view that when you're an ultra runner, there's no worry about times. It's, you know, you, even if you're winning races, times, distance, you know, pace, it's irrelevant. You're just out there for the experience, for the fun of it, for exploring, you know, the distance. And so I, in the end, I managed to see both both perspectives but it, it took me a while initially i was very much on the side of the guy why are we walking up a hill this is we're not babies here you know we can run we can run up a hill i remember seeing um the footage of uh killian john there doing the hard rock where he was so far ahead he was kind of well this is not fun i'll just wait <laughs> and and he just sat down and waited for the second guy to catch him up so he'd have somebody to have fun he's out the race with and he goes, no, nah, you're in the lead. Why are you stopping? <laughs> That's, that wasn't the mentality, even with the elites. And I realized, like, in, in some ways, the, the particularly, I mean, trail running, obviously a shorter trail run, you know, you can, once you get good at the, at the technical stuff, you can go pretty fast, uh, and, you know, and they're running up hills. But when it gets to the ultra running, it's almost a bit of a misnomer, ultra running, once you get to like 100 miles and more. Because there's only running is only a small element of it, and there are people who are great runners who can't run well over 100 miles on the mountain, and then there's people who actually not even that good, terrible at 10k, but probably not even that good at marathon, who can do really well in these races, often you know top five, uh, and it's just it's about mindset, it's about perseverance, it's about exploration, it's about being able to stay awake, being able to eat on the run. There's so many elements. So the running is just a small part of it once you get to a certain distance and, and, and especially in the technical terrain uh, in the mountains. So anyway, so yeah, there is a, there is, 
I think some some ways it's 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 quite different. And if you're a road runner, you, I think you've just got to accept that this is almost like a different sport you're doing. You can't really compare it too closely to your road running times. I think you you mentioned Miwok uh, 100, which was your first qualifying race. I think for gathering points to get into uh, to to the UTMB, and and you meet a couple of people there who are pretty obsessive characters. Um, Dave Mackay, who is a chap who I've seen his stories, a chap who injured his his leg quite uh, severely. He was a very good trail runner and, and got extremely badly injured and ended up amputating his leg. Is that, is that the guy I'm thinking of, Dave Mackay? Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So he decided, he took the decision that, well, my leg's not working properly, better to have an amputation and then go yeah. for a prosthesis and then I'll be able to run the trails again. And yeah. then um, also... Um, Katra Corbett, who we see, uh, I see online quite a lot um, mm. on some of the forums um, that I'm in, who had a very addictive, I think she had drug addictions or alcohol addictions yeah. and has worked her way out of that by being a very obsessive um, um, ultra runner. She has many, many tattoos and she runs with a little, a little Dachshund dog called Truman who goes yeah. sort of everywhere with her. Two, two in different ways, but two very obsessive type of characters. And we see a sort of a theme, which is the deeply obsessive nature of, of, many, of many of the ultra runners. Tell us about those people and, and, and whether there's something that, you know, a trait that runs through. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I even got to the point where I was starting to think I'm just, you know, I don't have traumatic enough of a story to be good at ultra running. Because yeah. You yeah, haven't I suffered did. enough in your life. Exactly. We're too sheltered, issues. Alan. That's why. <laughs> we are. Yes. <laughs> I don't have enough issues to work through. And and yeah, there was definitely I remember when I met Camille Heron at the uh Comrades. She just won the Comrades Marathon. I met her the next yeah. morning. And I went up to her and said, I'm I'm uh I'm writing a book about ultra running. It'd be great to talk to you. And it was at the prize giving ceremony. So I didn't want to disturb her. I was just saying, just great to get your number and I'll call you sometime. And she just turned around and she gave me this crazy stare and said, you have to talk to me. I have a crazy story. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, <laughs> another, another crazy ultra runner. And, and she's great. I, lo- I love Camille. And she's got some great stories. So I, I just said at the time, I said, well, what can, I mean, I'll talk to you another time, but briefly I was just intrigued. What? And then she just said, when I was 16, my whole family were made homeless by a tornado. <laughs> oh, wow okay i need to know more about you uh but uh, yeah and and so there is definitely a lot of ultra runners who uh i mean uh jim walmsley has got quite a uh intense backstory uh you know been suicidal or been discharged from the air force you know it, it's a definitely a recurring theme there and i think being out there in those intense envir- in those intense conditions and, and and pushing yourself to those limits kind of puts everything in perspective in one way and, and it brings you to a place I guess so far removed that you could start working through these things but it's definitely not prerequisite for being an ultra runner and, and for every person with a kind of intensive obsessive background there's people like Killian Hornet is that how I've since realized it's supposed to be pronounced Killian Hornet who is uh you know quite easy going with it all he only runs half the year the rest of the year he's off skiing and mountaineering uh and then you know there, there's we've got some people in the uk damien hall a friend of mine who, who came fifth at the utmb you know he he's got a pretty pretty straightforward background quite similar to mine in fact so there's definitely i think it definitely attracts people with an obsessive mindset and and maybe there are people who've had for because of that obsessive mindset have had issues in their past yeah it, and i think and i think that there, there, there is something intense about the experience of ultra running which i think is definitely going to attract someone who's after an intense experience. It's like, I, I remember I used to run 10 Ks and half marathons and then I ran a marathon and that just felt so much more epic. It was like that feeling, you know, I, I remember I cried after, for no reason, I wasn't sad or happy. Mm-hmm. I just started crying at the end. I said, whoa, what's going on? I'm so emotional. But then in mm-hmm. ultra running, that, that is multiplied and, and you were describing you know, people crying even at the start of the race. And uh you know, and I, when I finished the Comrades Marathon, they actually have people on the line to give you a hug. That's their job because they just know everyone's going to come in with these broken spirits, and 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 so that 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 that's kind of tied in, I think, and it's quite a complicated 
you know, everyone's got their personal reasons and a personal way in which they work through issues in their lives and in their past. But I think a lot of people find solace, find a kind of moment of peace out on the trail, which which they just can't find anywhere else. And and so yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's all it's different for every person, and it's wrapped up in a lot of things. And and lots of people come to ultra running from different places. But there's definitely probably more obsessive people with crazy backstories in ultra running than in in most sports. I'd say maybe maybe. maybe sky jumping or something has a similar story <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know why you'd want to do that but um <laughs> uh do you do you find that like since you've had this experience that you've sort of changed because i know that uh you kind of described the before the first the uh the old man desert marathon uh you were at the airport and there was like an eight hour wait time and and these other ultra runners that were also waiting for eight hours um because they were you know they were in the same flight and they sort of had this reaction that was completely different from yours they, they were they just, just dealing with it they just accepted it they were like okay so i'm going to take a nap right here in the airport and like your reaction was a little different and now because that was your very first experience yeah. like now let's say you had to go back to that same scenario do you feel like ultra running has sort of somehow changed things for you Yeah, if I'm if I'm totally honest, I feel like perhaps I mean just thinking about it, it feels like it's probably wearing off a little bit. But I definitely, you know, when I was in the midst of that ultra running and 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 for a while afterwards, I definitely had that sense. I you know I I quite often take journey. I I work quite far away from where I live, and the trains can be snarled up. And you can end up getting home very late, and and it, it could always be a big hassle. And I remember after those ultra runs, it felt like nothing. You know, nothing felt like nothing could touch me. I mean, I, this was not. And one day it was, which is quite rare here. The snow was so thick that there were no taxis, there were no buses, there was no. And it was about a three-mile walk ho- home, but but in thick snow, and and everyone who was getting off the train was in total panic. No one was being able to come and collect people, and I I didn't even I don't know what people did. And there were cars being abandoned on the side of the road, but I just put my bag on my back set off it was like right <laughs> i was like this is you know it's a three mile walk i mean what's the problem here uh, and so i do think and, and and even without specific examples i think just things like you know maybe having a bad night's sleep the next day you know in normal life i remember that that could stress you out a bit you think oh god no, i haven't slept well um you know now 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 i've got to deal with that i have some extra coffee well it just feels like nothing you know it's not it's not a problem so it's not it's not a it's not like i'm suddenly You know, Indiana Jones or something. <laughs> It just puts It, everything else into a different perspective. I think so, yeah. And and you just feel this kind of inner strength a little bit. But I, I wonder if it's wearing off. I haven't been tested for quite a while. We've had a very nice summer here, and we've been in in lockdown. Of course, that's been testing in a way. But I'm very lucky that I live in a nice part of the country. We we live in near the countryside, so I'm able to get out and about. And yeah, I don't can't recall the last time where I've had to kind of call on that kind of steeliness which I feel I, I I I developed through the ultra running but I definitely had experiences after it and during it where I thought hey this this is not a problem for me where where before I know even if I wouldn't necessarily have expressed it in like I did in Oman I think uh just mentally I'd have been a little bit like flustered by a situation where I just wasn't So I think you carry it with you, and I think that's a nice, a nice thing. And and I've had heard other ultra runners tell the same kind of stories, uh, and and in some ways maybe that's the appeal. It toughens you up. You know, we live in a very pampered world, particularly in the West, and and maybe it just feels like it toughens you up a bit. You feel a bit, a bit, I don't know, a bit steelier, a bit, a bit more kind mm-hmm. of hardened, which is maybe attractive to some people. I mean, it's quite interesting that more. Although women do very well in the ultra running and often beat the men, there's not as many women running it as 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 there are men. The, the entrance rates are much higher for men. And I wonder if they're well. I don't I don't know. I'm just thinking this now, so this might be a terrible thing to say. But I wonder if there's more of an uh, attraction to that kind of toughen themselves up for men. I don't know. I just a thought popped into my head. <laughs> We're just mentally insecure. We feel we have to go out and try and prove ourselves. Yeah, well, there, there may be. Yeah, you know, I was suddenly thinking there's a lot of other reasons why that could be the case. Exactly. Around about um, chapters, I think it's chapter nine, ten in the book, 
Um, you're, you're into your second uh, qualifying race uh, around Anglesey, uh, which sounded like a pretty tough race. And then you've yeah. got like only a five week break, which is not much for a recovery. I would want more than that for a marathon recovery. Um, and then you need to go to the Pyrenees and do a hundred mile run. And, and then you, t- t- another tough, tough race. But then you decide that you're going to do the 24 hour track race in between those two races. So we're yeah. talking about, um, you're not really an obsessive character and uh, you're not really mentally tough enough. So what on earth possessed you to do that? I was reading the book saying, why is he doing that? He's yeah. setting himself up for problems. What, what happens is the, the numbers become so ridiculously big that they stop having any meaning. So yeah, they don't you, impact you. No, you, 100 kilometers. Okay, well, done 100 kilometers, so 100 miles. That's not much further, right? And then, <laughs> miles, so then it was 135 miles over three days. Well, that's, and so I had this idea that, so I still did carry this slight feeling that you have, Elizabeth, of, of, of being a, like a roadrunner through the whole book. I, it was just, I never fully shed it. So when I looked at those races, my A race of those three was the track race. See, I thought I'm this is the one I'm going to be good at. I, I know how to do this, so I'm actually going to nail this. But I have to do the other two for the qualifying for the UTMB. But I figured the Anglesey one's the first one, so I'm fresh for that, so I don't need to worry about that. And also, that's over three days. So I mistakenly thought because you're splitting a hundred, it was 135 miles, so I mean, that's close to 200 kilometers, right? maybe even more. He's splitting that over three days. I naively thought that would make it easier. But actually, it made it harder. Well, not necessarily harder, but so we ran 40 miles the first day, which is a good run over hilly terrain. And then we, the race headquarters where everybody slept that night was just in this big sports hall uh, with strip lights that were left on until quite late and uh, quite a hard floor, noisy, echoey. And, and I didn't sleep a wink. Uh, and I got up, I remember I got up that morning. I, I woke up before my, well, I didn't, even wake up i got up before my alarm because i hadn't slept and and i could barely walk across the hall to the uh, bathrooms i was as stiff as anything and then i had to run 65 miles that day and that was probably my lowest point the end of that run where i got i got lost i, I took a wrong turn it was probably my lowest point in the whole book i think i was completely broken i mean and i crawled under these tables in this community center in this village in outer north wales and i crawled under this table and just shivered there the whole night ache i I was too achy to sleep and i got up barely able to pull myself up from the table and i had to go and run another 45 miles and by this time it was driving rain like horizontal rain and i just could not believe what was going on so so that hadn't planned out i hadn't panned out quite as i'd planned Uh, but then still i still had this thought that the the track race i was going to nail that and then i thought the 100 miles in in the pyrenees well i can go as slowly as i like but the fact that i need that for the utmb is going to get me through it and i didn't like by that point the, the, the numbers had like i said become meaningless so it was just 100 miles you know i'd done 100k i'd done 135 miles i just keep going for 100 miles and I'll get there and I'll get my points. And, and the fact that I need to, otherwise this whole book, this whole project, this whole UTMB thing is disaster. So I, I know I've got to do it. But of course, in the end, every, every ultra run in the end became such a kind of labyrinth of emotions and experiences. I mean, that book, I could have written the whole book on that Pyrenees race <laughs> alone. Uh, and so, yeah, so I, I basically was very naive and I didn't realize the scale of the task that I was undertaking and people had told me I'd, I'd actually posted my schedule online on Twitter and Facebook and experienced ultra runners were telling me I was mad but I I was thinking yeah but I'm not going to race them like you guys race them I'm just going to race the track race the others will be easy but yeah I learned my I learned my lesson the hard way that you don't do five ultra runs in five weeks uh, three ultra runs in five weeks that's a that's a bad idea <laughs> Okay, so if anyone's listening, it's not a it's not a recipe to follow. <laughs> so don't don't get your race schedule from the book. It's a bad idea. 
I think also part of that is because, you know, sometimes it's like the dead of winter, you finished all your races from the year before, and you're planning out your next year's race schedule, and you just put one thing and another thing, and then you realize, oh, I really want to do this other race, but it just so happens to be a little close to this race. Oh, but I'll fit it in. And then next thing you know, it's you've got you know, you're, you're in the thick of your, uh, you know, your race season and, and you're almost like annoyed because you have to go to this other race that you thought it was going to be such a great idea way back when you planned it. I think I made a mistake early on as well. I think I, my, I did a race, which I thought I, because the point system for UTMB is quite complicated. And so I thought I was only going to have to run one more race. And then I realized I, I didn't, I was going to be one point short. So I, then I realized I had to run these two races but then I really felt like this 24-hour track race fascinated me so much I felt I had to do that. It was a wonderful piece of reading for me to um, to to read the story of you on on the track race Mm. that you probably shouldn't have been doing in between your two qualifying races and watching you um, gradually uh, deconstruct yourself uh, as the monotony of the grind on the 24-hour race just ground you down to nothing basically yeah. um but but then surprise you get some ridiculous energy towards the end yeah and this is a little theme that seems to reoccur in some of your runs yeah and did you kind of work out what was going on there yeah i think i think i did in the end i mean i kept i kept having a different excuse why it was happening why i was breaking down each race but eventually I realized it was just, it was, it was this thing that, you know, is quite talked about in, in, in the running world of the central governor theory, uh, which was devised by Tim Noakes. And that's the idea that when your brain senses that you're in trouble, that you've got some, you know, you, you're kind of losing energy quite rapidly. You're running out of carbohydrates and everything else. It starts shutting you down. Your brain does. It kind of controls your, fatigue levels and so my brain I was realizing I was getting it was quite always happening around a midpoint of the race where I was obviously very tired but the the F, the huge amount of distance still remaining was just kind of overwhelming me mentally and so I was looking for excuses my mind started looking so either it was my sore feet or it was I couldn't keep food down or I was thirsty there was always some reason uh, I'd just done too many races in, in too many weeks. And all of those things seemed valid and probably had an, an element of truth to them at the time. But when I came through them, it always, it always when I got to that point in the race where I felt like I was within striking distance of home. And, and, and that varied depending on the race. It could be the last 10 miles or in the case of the track race, I think I got to three hours to go. And suddenly that just became a manageable chunk of time. I, I'd run for three hours. I knew what three hours running felt like. And it suddenly it's almost like my brain took took the brakes off. I said, okay, you're free to go now. You can go, you can have your energy back. And uh, and it was really interesting because once I realized that, I what I realized is the, the way I could deal with that was by not fixating on how far I had to go. And so what I started doing was stop wearing my watch because my watch, I mean, I would wear the watch for the time, but I didn't, I didn't have the GPS running, which was a shame because it meant I wasn't getting the lovely, incredible, impressive Strava uh, seg, you know, maps at the end. But I realized, because I would keep looking at it and I keep looking at it and, and the, the tireder I got, the slower the distance was going and the more I was thinking, so now I've got 49 miles to go. Okay. And then you run, 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 run. And, you look down, okay, and I've got 48 and a half miles to run. And this was what was grinding me down. Whereas if you just stay in that present moment, you just think, oh, I've got an aid station coming. I'm just keeping going to that. I'm not thinking beyond that. Or I'm just, you know, I'm just enjoying the scenery. I'm just here now in this moment. Actually, I was fine. And I, I finally got that. And there was, there was one race where it was the Lavaredo uh, Ultra Trail in Italy. And I didn't put the watch on. I started fairly conservatively and I had a wonderful race. I felt good the whole way through. It was the only time I really nailed a race. And I definitely put it down to that. At no, no point was I trying to calculate how far I had to go, what time I would get there, what would happen when I got there, <laughs> would I make it there? Which was, I think in my earlier races, I was fixated on the finish right from the beginning. 
Uh, and there was a there was one guy who told me just before UTMB, he he was one of the elite runners, and he was seemed a bit nervous. And he said, "I don't know. I always think of the finish too soon." And I, I at the time I couldn't quite understand why that was a problem. I thought, well, the finish drives you on, right? The thought of the finish is driving you on, but it's too far away. You can't have that in your mind that yeah. early on. You've got to mm-hmm. just be where you are, what you're doing, and and so once you do that, you, your mind is less less panicky in a way and so it's less likely to start playing tricks on you and and these tricks the mind and the thing is the mind and the reasons for you to slow down are quite reasonable right you know you're so tired and then you start saying well nobody really cares if i finish this race and i even had this i even had this quite funny discussion with myself where i thought i kept telling myself well it would actually be good for the book to have one dnf right then you could write about what it feels like to dnf <laughs> talking yourself into it <laughs> I think so this is the race I yeah so and it was really interesting the races where I had to get the UTMB points were kind of easier in a way for that reason because I knew I had to get there where like the track race I started saying was well I don't need to do this and 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 then that moment when you're in that middle of the night and it's true you don't need to do it and so you have to have a really Mm -hmm. strong reason for running reason for carrying on and, and, a, and a kind of really strong will and and someone said you have to know why you're doing this and and it's quite crucial i think if you're going to really test yourself to have a really good reason to get to the finish rather than the fact that you just kind of signed up on a whim and it looked fun yeah because it the the it, you're going to you're really going to try and talk yourself out of it <laughs> i think that i think that was why i mean there, there probably were elements i think perhaps in the me what race i was a bit dehydrated because I seem to recover after having a huge drink, but definitely the track race, it was a mental thing for sure. Not wearing your watch and sort of running in the moment. Was that one of the things you, you learned from your meeting with Mira Ray, the Nepalese uh, champion? Yeah, no, I, I loved meeting her and, and her, her attitude was, was so positive. I mean, again, that she, she was coming from a completely different perspective from anyone else I'd ever met. Having, she'd been a child soldier in Nepal obviously had witnessed you know war as a child had, and so just to be out in the mountains for her was was a thrill and I said you know I said to her well what do you do when you're really struggling do you do you want to stop she like looked at me like I was mad no you're in the mountains you just keep going what's wrong with you and I was like you just wow. run <laughs> you just run but I think it was it was hard for me in those moments to have that purity of appreciation of where I was I it's tricky to say. I don't think I learned it from her because I think I learned it from my own mistakes, but I could definitely relate to it. And, and it was very nice to hear her say that and, and to, to get that perspective. But yeah, I think that, that was, I met her at that race in Italy and I think I'd already kind of realized by that stage that this was the way to do it. I, I, and I think that maybe comes from road running, my road running background as well. I was always like looking, I said that mile in 12 minutes and now I'm doing this for I just had to forget about all of that. And, and what happens, I think, mm-hmm. I think it might have been Dean Karnazi. So as long as you're moving, you know, in perpetual forward motion, as long as you're moving, it doesn't matter about the speed. You're, you're doing pretty well. And you just got to keep, keep that momentum moving. And then once you start taking those kind of numbers and measurements and everything out of the equation, it actually frees you up mentally. And, and you can actually start looking up and looking at the mountains and enjoying it. And then, then suddenly you feel like you've got a bit more bounce in your legs and, hey, this is quite fun, actually, after all. I guess in in road running, uh, we tend to do that also because, you know, like you said, in the marathon, sometimes you'll be like, oh, that mile wasn't this much. Oh, I've slowed down by this much. It means my finishing time will be this much slower. I know that theoretically you're supposed to try and be in the moment as well, even in a shorter race like a 10K or a 5K. Um, It's it's not about just thinking about the finish line because usually uh, if you if you're hurting which you will at any point at some point in the race then then you'll you know it'll just be that extra sort of thing that will will discourage you instead of you pushing through that pain but it seems like for ultra running it's that much that much more important it seems like it's it, it was like a recurring theme. Um, the the runners that were just really good ultra runners just seem to um, seem to in their own way say like oh well um, like I enjoy being in the mountains or or you have to th- 
they talk about being in the flow and things like mm -hmm. that. They use terminology even to say, yeah. you know, in the groove. Yeah, I, de I definitely think it's true in marathon running as well. Actually, I think I think it's easier to to kind of follow a set time because, and 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 you kind of I don't think you get so overwhelmed by like your mind doesn't get so overwhelmed by the thought of the distance even in a marathon when you get to 10 miles to go that can seem like quite a long way and it can seem a bit debilitating but not in the way that like 50 miles can feel but uh, I but, can I, you imagine. Know, having, <laughs> but having or i can't <laughs> but, <laughs> but ha having uh having run with the kenyans and trained with the kenyans and seen their mindset their minds you know generally the mindset there is very much you just you just go with your feeling you know you just you, you train with your feeling and you and you race with your feeling and that's why they'll sometimes go through halfway or the first 5k or 10k of a marathon at a crazy pace and and like no one in their right mind and you know all the europeans and the americans are, are way back and and you know, a lot of these kenyans will drop out and, but one of them will carry on and win and, and they just go with the feeling and i think it's a big advantage that they have and uh and so, so it, it is applicable to road racing, but I think in the, in the ultra running, it can kill you. That's what it can do. In, in, the, in the marathon, it can slow you down. It can make you feel worse. It can, it can confuse you. But in, in ultra running, it can make you just say, it just make you stop. You just go, I can't, I can't do this. And uh, you just give up. And, and that's why the dropout rates of ultra running, you know, most races have, well, depending on the race, but often up to 40, 50% of the, of the starters drop out even these are experienced the utmb like you say you have to qualify for that so you everybody's run that has run a whole series of very very tough ultra marathons and yet still the dropout rate is over 40 percent every year so oh wow you know it's it, it's a it's a big challenge and and it's a mental challenge i think running a marathon is a lot of it is mental but there's a much more of a physical your running condition and it gets very mental in in, in ultra running. <laughs> So you've got to you've got to play your, your cards right, I think. One of the things that Liz and I have got have gotten quite interested in since we've been doing these podcasts and reading books on all sorts of things, or maybe I've got interested in Liz has always been interested in, is 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 what happens in between runs. You know, what are the things that you're doing to get yourself into a better condition and a better mindset, uh, or to stop yourself getting injured? Overuse injuries must be horrendous if you're into ultra running. And I noticed you seem to have a fascination in the book for uh, any new angles that come out that uh, allow you to um, treat your injuries or prepare your body better. In, in particular, one that I sort of followed up on after the book was the Anatomy in Motion with Carrie yeah. Ward. Yeah. Um, but you go through several of those. Um, did you come across some things there that, that were sort of new and, and value added for you? I mean, I mean, the big change for me was was the anatomy motion. I had this uh, Achilles problem, which I, I kind of got from trying to run like the Kenyans, from trying to run as Chris McDougall had convinced me, you know, in, in minimalist shoes, and I, I was convinced that it was helping my my running. I was running quicker. I was running. I felt good, but I was getting these Achilles problems, and and I just ran through them for about five years, and then I got a heel spur. And I was just thinking, I, it was right at the beginning of the ultra, I decided to do the UTMB. I was starting to look at my first ultra run. And I thought I was getting up every morning with that really sore twinge in my Achilles. A lot of people will know, <laughs> you're nodding. Uh, and then every run, it would warm up, but the first mile of every run was, was quite torturous. And I'd stop after half a mile, do a bit of stretching, and I kind of hobble through the first mile or so, knowing that eventually it would warm up and, and I'd get through it. Uh, and then I went to see this guy, Gary Ward, and did his movements. And, and the whole theory of it, it made sense to me. It's all about, you know, it's all about relearning your natural movement patterns, which for various reasons, uh, we've, we've kind of compromised our movement either through lifestyle, but more often actually through a previous injury, which means you've not used something and then you've, you've adapted your movement, your whole body's movement pattern to avoid using in my case, it was my left wrist. I'd broken my left wrist three times. And so that had just kind of slightly changed my whole shape of my body, but it didn't need to. My, it was, again, it was this overprotective mind that which controls your movement had kind of, was still protecting this arm, even though it didn't need to. And all I had to do was show it that this arm was free, that it was fine through these series of movements, which were very simple. And within three days, 
maybe it was three or four days. I remember getting up in the morning and, and not having that pain in my Achilles. I was like, that's strange. I almost was like banging my foot trying to find it and it wasn't there. <laughs> Where's it gone? Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and, then, and then the first run, I was like, it's not, it's not I couldn't believe it. And I, I've never had Achilles pain ever since. So it was a kind of miracle cure for me. I mean, it, obviously my issue was to do with a movement pattern. Someone else might have a completely different issue. It, it was it was a very fascinating thing. And I did I did with through the through the three books, I did try various things like like minimalist uh, running. I tried a thing called uh, muscle activation, which which had some some kind of effect on me, but nothing as great uh, groundbreaking. The other thing that was quite interesting was uh, a thing called Feldenkrais, which is actually quite old. I think it was maybe devised in the 1970s and has been around and and it's usually not usually used for running injuries. It's more of a people who have bad backs and that kind of stuff use it. But there was a, there's a woman called Jay Crunky. Uh, I hope I've said her name right. Uh, she's, she's called Balanced Runner online. And she's very good. And she specializes in, in kind of using Feldenkrais to help people with running. And I had a session with her. And it was a similar idea. It was all this idea that your movement is controlled from your brain. And so that if you introduce, if you say change the running form by saying hold your, so she got me to hold my hands up. But if she said, if you just, if you tell someone, look at their running form, say, oh, their head's too far forward, hold your head up. There's a reason why your head's forward. It's because you're, you're kind of trying to balance yourself. You're trying to compensate for something else that isn't working. So if you put your head up, it feels wrong. It feels like, and so you won't, you won't keep to it. So what they need to do is they need to repattern your, your, thought processes your brain's control of the body and so with anatomy and motion you do it through these series of gentle movements in feldenkrais they they the practitioner themselves actually very gently move you to show you show your brain basically subconsciously that this movement is fine that this movement won't hurt you that it's not something you need to maintain anymore because you're through it and and, and so i'd already done the anatomy and motion by that point i already cured my achilles so there wasn't really anything to cure, but she did change my the, the way I held my arms. And it was very strange because it felt immediately natural. So we did the session and then she so she, she watched me running beforehand. Then we did this, what they call a rolling session where she very gently manipulates me. Uh, and I'm not, she didn't really explain what she was doing, but then she told me to hold my arms in this different position. And it felt natural immediately. And I have to say every run ever since, that's how I hold my arms. And, and since then I've been to form coaches and they say, yep, and you're holding your arms perfect. <laughs> and they always say that they always comment on the arm, but, but Jay would say, if I just told you to hold your arms without the rolling session, you would have done it for me there. And you maybe would have done it in the first two or three runs, but eventually because that wasn't, your brain wasn't happy with it because it was a change imposed on you. You would have gone back to your old way. And so she said, so you, so you've got to kind of, show your body physically that's the basic idea behind feldenkrais i i thought it was great and uh i i know i know people have used it for injuries and, and it's really helped but it's more for prevent it's more both of those things are more for fixing a movement pattern that's causing an injury uh rather than you know if you've got broken your toe for example no end of like movements is going to fix that that has to be fixed probably just by rest i would imagine i don't know i'm not, I'm not an expert on that <laughs> broken toes but, uh, but yeah, it, it was nice to try. I, I tried, I, like I say, I talk about in the book, I have a guy who, who tries all sorts of techniques out on me. I'm like his, his guinea pig. But they were the, those were the ones that actually I followed up in, in a proper way. He was like massaging my eyes and, and showing me these lines on a screen. And we were trying all sorts of things. But the anatomy motion is, is a very a powerful tool. And I've, I've sent quite a few people. I don't know how you found it if you've been to a session. but I've had quite a lot of success from the, well, not I've had success, but the people who have been on my recommendation and then have come back to me, I've had quite a lot of success with it. So I think it's a powerful thing. Yeah, I have a science background uh, as a pharmacist, qualified pharmacist. So if something's not based in science, I yeah. tend to be very skeptical. Yeah. Um, and I looked at Gary Ward's stuff online. Yeah. And in fact, it's very, very rooted in very good physiology. Mm. And so you go, yeah. Looking at it instead of going, well, what is this movement thing? Yeah. Um, when you look at his stuff online, 
um, you go, yes, that makes 100% perfect scientific sense. Well, that's good. What he's doing. Yeah. And that, that was my sort of reaction to that. And I was trying to show, show Liz a movement that I've seen online <laughs> and, and doing all of the various positionings and um, didn't quite work. So I said, uh, you better go and look at the YouTube. <laughs> Yeah, my, my kids, I, I, I still do the movements uh, every now and then just partly because they feel very nice to do. You're, there, you're just kind of using your, your body to its, to its full range in, in certain dimensions. And, but my kids are like, like the, you know, oh, no, he's doing that move again. <laughs> like, he's doing those weird movements. A very bad ballerina. <laughs> being Don't good. bring any friends around the house <laughs> when daddy's doing his movements. Exactly. Yeah. Are they teenagers yet? Because I feel like that's going to be one of those things they're going to be asking you. Hey, I'm going to have some friends over, but can you like not do those things that you usually do? Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. I was. Uh, I was going. I was just going to say there was a. Uh, the other day I was on the beach and it, it was quite an empty beach and there was nobody that near us. And I just thought, well, my kids were playing around. I can't just do a few moves while I'm standing here. And about two seconds later, I almost got rugby tackled by my son. He dived on me. I like, stopped doing that. So, uh, yeah, I have to do them in the privacy of my own room. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't want to um, finish our, our interview without asking you about uh, Elizabeth Barnes because yeah. she appears she appears at the front. as She's like the start of your story as your, almost your, your guru yeah. or your teacher. And she appears at the end and it looks like you became good friends during the book. Yeah, well, I guess she was one of the people I connected with in my first race. Uh, and uh, yeah, then we went for a couple of runs together. Yeah, she was kind of showing me the ropes very kindly at the beginning and uh, looking out for me. And, and, and she went through a few, she's been through a few transformations herself uh, over the course of the book and, and since then, actually. So she, uh, she then became vegan. Uh, and so she, I, so initially at the beginning, I wanted, as well as my own story, I, I kind of felt like it'd be good if there were a few other people who went on this journey through to the UTMB with me. And so Elizabeth was one and Tom Payne, a good friend of mine, was the other. But unfortunately, Elizabeth, I can't remember the reason, but she didn't run the UTMB in the end. But she was there with her, her boyfriend, who, who was one of the elite runners. Uh, so I met up with her there to kind of bring the story to a close. But yeah, she's a great, she's a great runner. She, you know, was similar to me, had been marathon running at a, at a kind of pretty good level, but nothing superstar. And, and just, she said, you know, there was this decision, do I want to try and go faster, which is, you know, a good challenge and something I could keep doing. I think, I think she'd run 250. So it was pretty good time. Or I could go longer. And then when she went longer, she found she was really good at that. And so she won, she won the marathon, the Saab, two times uh, and one she seems to be particularly good in the desert particularly likes the desert she doesn't like getting her feet wet yeah i actually met elizabeth barnes um while i was doing the trans rockies uh multi-stage race she she was doing that she was a little bit further up the field than i was yeah. but i did get a chance to talk with her a little bit she's certainly a very capable uh, uh runner in the mountains well we had a we had a it was funny in oman because we had identical marathon times and we'd actually run both run 250 in, a, in the london marathon quite recently and so i uh, i thought well each day we set off on, on the aman race i thought well i'll stick with her because you know, women are generally better at pacing themselves and uh with similar marathon times so i'll just stick with her and you know that that would be a good policy and yeah like one minute in she's shuffling like through the sand like a traction engine on them but her feet were going so quick I was like, whoa, I can't keep this up. This is... And so she disappeared into the distance each day. And uh, that was the end. I'd see her back at the camp. Uh, but yeah, she's, she's, a, she's a great person. She's now, she's actually moved out. She was living in the UK. She's now moved to Norway, I think, or Sweden, uh, where she's living. So I, I haven't seen her as, as much recently. And I, as far as I know, she's not, she's kind of decided she's not, going to be as competitive anymore as she was she's kind of not aiming to be a competitive athlete anymore. maybe a good guest for your podcast uh Adarna. yeah certainly yeah so she uh she's still coaching and doing running camps and, and things but yeah she's a, she's a lovely person and really helped me out at the beginning when i was completely raw and i had to ask her questions you know like well well she was quite shocked when i turned up in oman and i didn't have gaiters for, for an oman sand race and 
and uh, you know I hadn't been, had no idea how heavy my pack was or what food I was going to eat <laughs> on which day, <laughs> which are all all very basic mistakes to make. Uh, so she helped me out quite a lot. I noticed you mentioned a 250 marathon, and I actually I looked you up. I stalked you on the uh, British um, Running Records site. It's some general site that collects all of your all the data of runners. Yeah. And I noticed you had a 250 marathon. I noticed you had several three hour and something like three or three or five or three or eight marathons. Um, right. And I'm I'm currently a three or eight marathon and I have a growing ambition pulled by Liz because she's on a mission. She's probably shy and doesn't want to talk about it, but um, it has to a, happen. She's on a mission <laughs> to run three a sub three hour marathon. Now you yeah. you're you're in you're goal. in our um our, yeah. our sphere of action. So yeah. uh, and you've run some plus three hour plus and some three hour mar- minus. So although a disclaimer, I will be very happy with the two fifty nine fifty nine, but I will mm. not be happy with the three zero 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 one that will not do it (laughs) so can you tell Liz what she has to do well I mean it's it's tricky because it all depends where where you're starting from I guess but uh I mean one thing I've I've worked a lot on and I've been continue to work on and I think is crucial is is like running form and I think if you've got a good bounce and a quick cadence and, and you can but but it's a complicated thing to work on because I think you shouldn't just you know google it and say what what you know how should i run like i say with the feldenkrais stuff is if you just try and emulate good form but there are techniques and 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 people who are good at this and there's more and more form coaches out there and if you can find a good one who can get you using your elastic energy basically when you when you if you run with a good cadence you're getting free energy off the ground out of your elastic you know your tendons and your and and everything if, if you plodding all the energy is dissipating and then you're having to create that step again now like I say, it depends where you're at because you may be doing that already, in which case you can't benefit from that. But if you're not doing that, there's huge gains to be made. And I, I actually went from, a, before I went to Kenya, I was, I had a 130 half marathon and I hadn't done a marathon. And then I came back and ran a 117 uh, marathon. So that was a 13 wow. minute improvement. Uh, and a lot of that I put down, I'm obviously, I was, I was running more, but I put a lot of that down to working on the form and improving my, my running form. Uh, apart from that, I mean, like I say, it depends what you're not doing right, and I don't know that, but like rest is a key thing, but it sounds like you said you're usually in bed by 10 o'clock, so you're probably okay on the yeah, rest. Yeah, I've got, I've got the, the, the rest part <laughs> should be should be fine. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I'm sure you know all the stuff about making sure you're doing intervals, and, and I'd say one thing I learned from the Kenyans is if you're, once you're in a hard training block, uh, when they do their easy runs, they do them really, really easy so that they're nice and fresh for the, for the quality uh, stuff. They don't mind running, you know, and I'm going to, we work in miles. Uh, and they don't, you know, they don't measure it, but they're running what for me as a three hour marathon runner, I could be running with a 205 guy and his slow run feels too slow to me. It's like a 10 minute mile. So it's like a seven minute kilometer, eight minute kilometer. Yeah, that's crazy slow. Wow. It's crazy yeah. slow, and and he'll happily run like that for an hour on on his easy day, and then uh, and then you know and then save that energy. But is well, you know, sometimes you think, well, maybe I don't even need to bother. But there is a, there's a lot to gain from slow running, and then the speed work when they do the speed work, they you know they they do it really good quality, and and they've got the energy. So you're not running the whole week exhausted and mm-hmm. not being able to put the quality. In. I think that because I used to feel like every run, if I wasn't exhausted by the end of it, it wasn't worth it. And then I'd go out for these runs with guys who were running sub 60 half marathons. And I was like, that, what, what was that? That was easy. I'm not even sweating. And, you know, we're in Kenya. So. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I heard this from a, one of my previous coaches and he said uh, that most of the time, or maybe it was a book I read it in, but most uh, the theory is that most of the time you should feel at the end of your interval workout like you could have done one more um, yeah. if you had to. So so you shouldn't be like completely uh, destroyed, basically. Yeah. Except maybe a couple key workouts that might be more difficult, like leading up to a, a goal race. But usually that was sort of the the advice that uh, that i've heard in the past 
Yeah, I mean, I've watched I've watched uh, Elliot Kipchoge training in a group, and he's clearly the quickest athlete there. But he's not leading the the intervals. He's like in the pack, and you think, well, he's clearly not running a hundred percent in that case. And and mm -hmm. that's that's true. That's the case. He's running at like ninety percent, and that's fine by him. The other guys are running maybe a bit harder to to try and facilitate that for him. But uh, yeah, uh, there's you know there's so many little things you can do in running. One thing the Kenyans like to do is they like to do their long run kind of as a progression run, which is not something you need to do every time, but it's quite, we often, people when they're training for marathon, often the long run is just done at a relaxed pace. But to add some tempo to the long run is something the Kenyans like to do. But, and then again, then it's just mindset as well. Like we were talking about the mindset in the ultras. While it's not as crucial in the road running, if you're, talking about the difference between 301 and 259 you know you're looking at every little every little change you can make and I think being able to not become too fix, fixated and on on like you know stressing yourself out um, I'm two seconds behind my time now I've got you know and that sends me into a panic mode and then I'm five seconds ahead you just get into a flow and, and just kind of trust yourself and feel feel how it feels when you're running all those things but they all take they all take practice and and then fueling on the run, I mean, goodness me, you know, I'm, I'm not a coach, but it's just looking for those little areas where, where it's not all going right. Yeah. But, and then, of course, the big thing is not getting injured, okay, which is because if you're going to push the training, you don't want to get injured. So then you're, that's why I think things like natural emotion and, and if you can find something that kind of makes you strong, uh, gets your body functioning and movement, and that again comes back to running form. Yoga. You know what running form yoga i mean i'm i'm not convinced by yoga i think being too is that, is that i hope that's not the bad thing to say but i think there's a case i mean the kenyans don't stretch very much and they're not super flexible and uh, yeah but none of them are 62 years old like me no that's true probably, probably helps if you're 62 that's true and they definitely aren't super stiff either at the same time they can definitely touch their toes and things yeah, I mean, everything has its, everything's individual, like you say, for, for you, maybe yoga is a, is a very good thing to be doing. So, yeah, I don't know. Run your slow run slow and get lots of rest and, and make sure your form is as bouncy as it can be. <laughs> Perfect. I'll, okay. I'll work on the bouncy part. <laughs> if, it doesn't, yeah. if it doesn't work, we'll come back to you for a refund, uh, Darren. We've even been doing the, uh, with my, my friend here who treats me like the guinea pig, we've even been doing... Uh, the Maasai bouncing, oh, yeah. the Maasai goes yeah. jump, and we just we just to get that bounce back into our feet because our feet have become most of us in in the West, our feet have become dead. They basically don't do anything, so we've just been bouncing on the floor. Yeah. It's exhausting. You can't do it for that long. Yeah, but it just you know re reactivates yeah. your feet and gets them bouncing again. So well, we did we did a podcast uh, on a, a book called Running Rewired by a guy called uh, mm. Jay Desherry who is a big researcher in, in uh, physiology uh, on the mm. West Coast. And uh, he's very, very into everything starts at the foot. Yeah, no, I think so. I think, and I think particularly in the West, that's the part of our, right from an early age, when you start wearing shoes, we've kind of taken the feet out of the equation. We still use pretty much everything else, but we don't really use our feet. And, mm -hmm. they're, and they're clearly crucial in terms of, particularly for running yeah that's exa uh, actually exactly what he uh what he sort of says is um is exactly yeah. that yeah i'll have to get that book out sounds good this could go on for uh for a long time yeah. and, and take you uh through to the pumpkin hour in the uk if we're not careful um yeah. you know, one of the things before we before we get to the end that uh, that i do want to ask you about uh darren and uh, which is sort of the the essence of of the story to some extent with respect to ultra running is it is it achieving the goal at the end of the day is it achieving the goal in terms of getting to the end of this magnificently difficult uh, um, challenge is, is that the reward or or is the reward fundamentally just the experience of of coming through the suffering um, because you you talk a little bit about being almost disappointed when you get to the end. You know? Yeah, well, I definitely I definitely had had a, a quite a big realization about that through the course of the book. So, I think when I first started ultra running, I saw it 
as a challenge and, and i envisage the finish being this kind of a static moment where you you've conquered the the challenge you've set yourself out and set out for yourself and, and it's been quite a difficult thing to do and, and there you are you, you kind of conquered it and you come home with this with this amazing feeling and yeah i had this quite anticlimactic feeling uh, quite often at the end of the race and it was often when i look back there was a much more profound and, and kind of enjoyable feeling during the race and, and there was a there was not the what i had some very low moments as well but there were some incredible highs within the race and i think that's where the experience is really i think that's when you look back and when you want to do another ultra run where something's calling you to do another ultra run it's not that sense of achievement it's not that sense of conquering the impossible or walking around saying oh, i ran 100 miles it's that kind of sense of being in the eye of the storm where you've kind of been battling and battling and then what happens i mean i don't know if you've experienced this in your ultras but you kind of suddenly you come into this moment of calm where you're kind of aware of where you are but the rest of everything else in your life is is, is forgotten you know you, you're just existing in this one moment where you're just you know i'm just going up this hill or i'm just coming down this hill and you've forgotten what your job is and you've forgotten who your family are and you've forgotten everything else and you've even forgotten the fact that you're in a race in in some ways that you're trying to get you know you're trying to get there as quickly as possible you're just moving and it, and it, i think when i look back i felt those were the those were the moments that really stuck with me the most i remember in the utmb coming through it was the dawn on the on the second day just feeling really peaceful just really like I, I, and 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 then like when i got to the end of some of these races almost was disappointed that i was it's like i was just getting it i just getting it i don't want to stop now rather than like oh finally i'm i'm here i've done it so that was an interesting thing and, and i think that will possibly a very personal thing to me perhaps or uh but then then you do get these these runners who talk about the pain cave and they talk about digging in the pain cave and that's where they relish it when it really gets tough in the race and they're kind of faced with the the hardest bit and then they get through that it's not they don't often talk about the finishing line euphoria so so yeah maybe it's not a, a personal thing maybe it's a universal thing but definitely yeah it's because i was i was trying to put my finger on what is what is the real appeal appeal of this and i felt there always comes a moment in 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 a race where you're just at one with what you're doing with yourself with your movement uh with where you are and, and everything else drops away and it's a very peaceful feeling and i think that when you get that you think oh all right this is what i want more of this i'm going to come back and do another one of these <laughs> i don't know if that answers your question maybe i we're just interested to hear your opinion there's no there's no yeah. there's no real answer is there i think that the answer exactly. is the answer is personal for everyone um but it's great yeah. it's great to hear to hear those sorts of things because i think you know we sit on the outside and we go why would you want to do this i always say yeah. that you know i see people running these hundred mile ultras they never look very happy yeah. they're not smiling they're somewhere yeah. else maybe they're smiling on the inside or but you know yeah. They look pretty often look quite crushed. Um, yeah. And they they do they do another one after it's all done. So that's yeah. kind of the we actually have a teammate of ours, um, Pete. He's he's done several hundred mile ultras, and I mean, he, you know, a hundred mile ultra. It's not rare that it that it takes twenty four or thirty hours. So yeah. it means you're running through the night. Sometimes you're running through two nights, and just you know it's just such a long way to go and and he uh, you know there's always it seems like every single race there is always a low point it's it's like inevitable yeah. and it makes you wonder sort of how is it that he you know it can't be the belt buckle that keeps you coming back there's yeah. got to be something else because i i think it's not it's not even like you said they don't know happy i don't think it's it's even a happiness or, or you know it's certainly not fun but I think it's the intensity of the experience. It's so intense that it's so rare that we've experienced something that intense. I mean, perhaps, you know, it's it's almost, you know, I, and, and I do have this interesting experiment where I brought a Kenyan runner uh, over to the UK to run a, a ultramarathon. And he was, he was winning the race easily and then he dropped out because he had a sore toe. But afterwards, I had this sense that perhaps he didn't need that intensity of experience because maybe his life was a bit more intense. But I felt like, 
for a lot of the amateur ultra runners who've probably got quite comfortable lives it took you to a place that you never go of, of yeah that you never go and that perhaps in a way as a human you know as an, and we're all animals underneath and we, we would evolve to live in the wild perhaps it takes you closer to that kind of to your own sense of who you really are and who you who you evolved to be to deal with these kind of intense experiences and and perhaps somehow by doing that it, it gives you this sense of fulfillment in, in some way okay i'll leave it there <laughs> Um, from a from a book perspective, you know you you're clearly a um, an accomplished writer, and uh, you're learning to be a learning to be a, an accomplished ultra runner uh, during the writing of the book. And, and from that perspective, um, it made for a great read. I don't know how Liz thought, but I, it reminded me a lot of of the style of the book that we reviewed a few weeks ago with Matt Fitzgerald. Uh, called Running the Dream, where he was embedded with um, an elite marathon running team in America. And uh, he wrote a book about being his, a fake pro runner, um, okay. learning the pro running. And uh, he had a very journalistic uh, writing style, two totally different subjects. But for me, extremely readable. You know, I was devouring the book. I struggle with some some of the reading. Liz is the Liz is the big reader. She's always telling me to hurry up and catch up reading. Usually, more. usually I'm the first one to finish the book, and then I'll be like, "Alan, are you done?" And he says, "No, I'm... no, in a few days." <laughs> <laughs> and this was the opposite. Yeah, I, I, I'd finished the book, um, so extremely readable. Um, having been to uh, a few of the places that you were talking about, um, you know, I'm born in England. Yeah. I guess I was able to live vicariously, you know, when you describe the aid stations at Valocene. I've been through those. I've done the LCC. Yeah. So um, I, I know vividly the, the, the image appears in my head. But just yeah. the way you wrote it made for very good, uh, very, very good storytelling and learning at the same time, meeting all the cast of the cast of uh, uh, who's who almost in ultra running was also fun and learning about those people as we, as we went through. I think for me it was um, because I don't have the same, same knowledge of the ultra world and all these names. Um, I know that Alan, you know, we would sort of be uh, talking during the runs and he'd be like, Oh, he meets, meets this person. And it was a name that yes, I read in your book. And then I would, I was more focused on the story. So I found like, it was still very engaging, but I didn't necessarily know any of these famous ultra runners because I, I, I'm not so familiar with, with that, but I, I, yeah, I have to say that it was a very enjoyable reading still, even, even though for me, it was more the story. And I really related to the way that you were, you had started out as a road runner and you, you kind of had a little bit the same opinions as I had about um, about like why do people do this ultra running thing? So so that made it very it made it very relatable to me. Was uh, was you know you seem to come from sort of the same place as as I was coming from uh, related to the ultra running scene and uh, with the way you put the stories in of you know the stories that all these. Uh, really great runners told you it was um yeah it was very very enjoyable um i was kind of wondering what what's next in your list of projects do you have any other plans for books or anything else are you still gonna run ultras even though your book is written yeah well i i actually had so i ha i haven't run an ultra since uh the UTMB in 2018, uh, but I did have one planned in China in uh, this March, but obviously that uh, was quite bad timing. China was not the mm -hmm. place to be going in March. Uh, and then I had a, a sky race, which I'd never done. Which, so sky running is not necessarily ultra distance, but it's it's uh, a lot of them are ultra races, but they're, they're trail races in the mountains above a certain height. So they're quite tough, tough races. So, so yeah, it was funny because I, I kind of after the UTMB, I thought thought maybe I, I mean I, a couple of my friends are ultra runners. They said so. So what's next? And I actually wanted to go and run a road marathon. And a lot of the ultra runners were very disappointed in me in that they thought once you go to ultras and trail running, you never go back. 
but I wanted to kind of capitalize on all this fitness and I, I still think I could run under 250. Uh, I mean, my, my half marathon time in 117, I think, I think it's, it's totally feasible, especially after all these ultra runs, but then everything, nothing quite worked out. I, I had a race that was canceled or for, for various reasons it didn't work out. And then this whole lockdown has happened. So I kind of haven't done the ultra or the, or the trail run, but, I think I, I still want to do both. Basically, I want I want to go back, but I don't necessarily want to run a hundred miles again. I think I like the shorter ultras. I think I, I, there's still a long way. You still get that intensity of experience. I think for running fifty miles or hundred k, uh, but it doesn't take you to a place where you're completely destroyed. Which I felt like my hundred mile races were a little bit like that feeling I had when I've, I've done this now. I do not need to do this again. Mm-hmm. So you don't miss hallucinating, basically. <laughs> Doesn't sound like it. What about books? Um, do you have another book in mind or are you got something that you're starting to think about now? Yeah, I actually have a, a couple of thoughts in my head, but I, I'm not sure I should say them because there's quite a high chance that nothing will happen with either of them. But uh, Fair enough. But I... I they're just ideas at the moment, but but they 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 involve running. They're they're running ideas. I did kind of think maybe I don't need to write about running next time. I could write about something else. But my leading leading ideas are are, are running based books. So we'll see see what happens on that. Okay. Well, we we'll look forward to we're going to look forward to to seeing that coming out. And in the meantime, we'll satisfy ourselves by reading your back catalog. Mm-hmm. Uh, so maybe we should wind it up. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Darren and we know we know it's late. No, it's been it's been great to chat. It's been fun. So thank you for listening to another episode of Running Book Reviews. Uh, shout out to the publisher Pegasus Books for providing an advanced review copy and also putting us in touch with the author. If you would like to leave us feedback uh, about how we can improve the podcast or want to suggest a book that you'd like us to review in future episodes, you can leave us a comment on social media. So we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. On Facebook and Instagram, you can find us as Running Book Reviews. And Twitter, we are reviews underscore running. Uh, You can also uh, follow us on social media and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite streaming platform. And if you'd uh, like to get a copy of this book, which is Rise of the Ultra Runner by Adheran and Finn, uh, we're going to leave a um, uh, an Amazon affiliate link. It doesn't cost you anything to to get the book from from that link, but it can help out the podcast. But um, seeing as how we're trying to support local businesses these days, if you do have a bookstore and you're able to get your your uh, your books from there and they have this book, then prioritize that. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. That's basically the end of our pod- podcast. Uh, we'll wrap it up here and get off and do our ultra running training now that we're inspired.